Bonjour, welcome to Miss Lucy's Classic Cajun Culture and Cooking. I'm your host, Miss Lucy, and today I'll be raising cane, sugar cane, that is. And in about six months, I'll be ready to chop this beautiful little plant down. So you stay with us, shall we? Have a wonderful show lined up for you. We'll be right back. The Louisiana Seafood Marketing Board is a proud sponsor of Lucy's Classic Cajun Culture and Cooking Show. The Bayou State enjoys an outstanding culinary tradition. At the center of that tradition is seafood. And no wonder, Louisiana is one of the nation's leading seafood suppliers. And the Louisiana Department of Economic Development. Whether it's crawfish processing or meat packing, Louisiana is the business location for food processing. With infrastructure, site selection assistance, and workforce training. Louisiana, the shape of food technology. <laughs> What makes Louisiana so special? Our beautiful bayous and grand plantation homes surrounded by old oak trees. Our music and joie de vie. Our unique way of cooking the bounty we harvest from the land and the water. It's our communities, our businesses, our people. That's why I love Louisiana and why I want to share my precious Cajun heritage with you. Have you ever heard of Indiana Jones? Well, I'm Louisiana Lucy. The reason I have this machete is that when we used to cut cane with this type of instrument when I was a girl, I really enjoyed eating that cut cane that my daddy would peel the stalks and I'd chew that sweet juice out of it. I mean, it was hard to chew, but it was wonderful. It tasted so good. Now today, I'll be cooking with sugar cane syrup and sugar. So let's get started. Get rid of this instrument. I don't think I need a knife this big. Right, first thing I'm gonna cook today is one of my favorites. I have these gorgeous little Cornish hens. And of course, I know that one time this young man came to my house and he ate. And I had cooked Cornish hens. And he had apparently had never eaten them before. So he went home and his mama said, well, Terry, what did you eat today? And he said, I don't know, mama, but Miss Lucy cooked some baby chickens. Well, little did Terry know that he was correct about it because that's actually what these are. These are 28 day old chickens and they are so tasty. So what you must remember to do is that, first of all, I cut all the, the skin off of right here. And of course, I trim it up real good and lay them out flat like this, wash them real well, because you want to do that with poultry. And then, after I've done that, I take my salt and pepper, and I season them real well, because that's one good thing about it. You don't want to put too much salt and pepper, but you want to have a good, a good seasoning on it, because that adds to the flavor of it. I'm going to add just a little pepper here. You do that side first. Of course, I guess you can do any side if you want to. That's what I do anyway. It doesn't matter. Just go ahead and use your hands. That's, you just rub that in there because it just kind of, give it a massage or something, but it kind of just makes that go right into the, the skin, body. Very good. And it also, you know, hot sauce is good to uh, tenderize stuff too. So then you turn them on the other side. Of course, you do the same thing again. Well, you just use your salt and you do it real good. Now, and you pepper, you repeat the same thing. You rub it up, give it another good massage. All right, both sides. Can you do one and not the other? All right, very good. Now, see how gorgeous that is? They're pretty like that, aren't they? Well, this is going to be baking in the oven, and it's actually going to brown, and it's going to make a wonderful gravy. Now, the next thing you have to do, and it's going to be quick, too. You don't want to overbake these things. You spray it with this nonstick coating. Now, good, good bit, because it makes it so much easier to clean. Then you take your little baby chickens. You add them in the pan. And you're going to cook this for about an hour, an hour and a half at the most. But after it browns on the top, you flip them over and you turn them on this side. And I'm going to show you the finished product in a bit. But first, I'm going to go and I'm going to put this in the oven and let them bake while I fix rice dressing. Put it in here. 
Okay. And of course, the reason I'm fixing rice dressing is that it goes with most anything that you can cook. It really accommodates this. It makes it really blend it together. So we've got our ground beef, lean ground beef. I'm gonna brown this real well, which I've already browned it some. Now, after you brown your ground beef, you have to saute your, your uh, onions in here, which you chop up your onions, not too fine, but you don't want them chunky. So I'm gonna add my onions, my bell pepper. You have too much of that bell pepper, can you? Of course, that's only if you like bell pepper. And I do, I love bell pepper. And this here. Now actually, I'm gonna brown all this together. Let it cook real well. So, now what I usually do sometimes, today I've only used the uh, ground beef, but now sometimes I like to add a different flavor to my uh, rice dressing. You can either put, I like to ground up gizzards, chicken gizzards, and just put that in there, about half and half, like one pound of each or half a pound of each, and, all, and put it all together and cook it together. And you can even add your ground pork to this and make it real good, real tasty. So, but actually, today, I'm gonna, you know, be doing it this way, but that's what's so good about rice dressing. You can put a lot of different types of meat in there. I guess you could even put your little sausages in there. So, and this, the children love it. You can fix that for the kids and they'll eat that just like this as a meal. And actually, you have your vegetables in there, too, so you really don't need too many other things in here. Okay, it's doing real well. Yeah, you see how pretty that is and how it's... Oh, man, it smells good, too. Oh, so actually, you can... It's almost done. Now, what I'm going to add to this, of course, is some cooked rice. Now, I like to add cold rice to this because what happens here is that if you add hot rice when you're cooking your dressing, it's going to kind of clump up and, and mushy it up. So you want to add some cooked rice that has been already chilled. Well, really put in the refrigerator overnight is the way I do it. And so I'm going to add some rice to this. There you go. Ah, if I spill, that's okay too. Okay, mix it all up. Now, you can add a lot of rice to this, or you can add just a little bit, as however you like it. Now, this is about the way I like it at my house, so that's what's good about Cajun cooking. You fix it the way you like it, so. Now, let me put my salt and pepper in here, and this'll season it up real good. There we go. Mm, I smell my chickens cooking. Mm-hmm, and my black pepper. Mix it up real good. Of course, I'm going to add some Louisiana hot sauce to that also. Excuse me. Very good. Got this. Mix it up real well. Alrighty. Very good. And onion tops. And that will complete your rice dressing. You let that simmer for about, I would say, 20 minutes. And honey, you've got a meal that really is good. This will finish it up here. You cover it and let it simmer for about 15, 20 minutes, and it's ready to eat. Oh, very good. Hmm, man, you already smell that. <laughs> Sugar cane is the most beautiful crop that I've ever seen grown. It seems like the tall leaves swaying in the wind. It's so tranquilizing to me. It's just the most beautiful and tranquilizing sight I've ever seen. And I was interested in learning more about this crop because I was on the rice farm, you know, didn't know nothing about sugar cane. But I'd also wanted to meet the people responsible for raising cane. Sugar cane is one of Louisiana's largest crops, and to find out more about how it's farmed, I thought I'd visit someone who knew all about it. Well, Mr. Sonny Adams, you have a lovely farm here. How many acres of uh, sugar cane have you been farming here? Well, I'm retired now, but I did farm around 500 acres. Right. Uh, but I retired in the, 80, the latter part of 89. I oh. harvested 89 crop, and then I retired. Well, how many years you did this? Uh, I started, well, I've been farming really since I could walk. I started working on the farm, and I worked 
for my father, then I went in partnership with my father, then I bought him out in 1959. So tell me about how do you farm, what time do you plant in the year? Well, the crop is planted actually in the fall. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's planted in September, more or less, a lot of part of August and September. Mm -hmm. But uh, it'll come up and grow until you get the first freeze. And a freeze in the wintertime will kill it back down. Okay. But the roots of this come back up in All the spring. Right. From then on, we start cultivating and taking care of the weed, control the fertilizing and mm -hmm. whatever we have to do. And uh, it'll go through to September, latter part of September, October, and we'll start the harvesting process. And then you combine those. You no, ma'am, I never did combine. Okay. Today they are combining, but since I've been retired, the combines have just come out. In I fact, I'll start it off with mules, believe it or not, oh. if you know what a mule is. Oh, I, I know. know. <laughs> I, I'm old enough to know but, what a mule uh, is. Uh, from then we went to tractors uh -huh. and we worked for them with, well, in 1945 was the first tractor my father purchased. Mm -hmm. And I started driving it when I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So you cut it down and it, then you'd load it up and load, bring it to the mill. Ship it to the mill, correct. And then they would... They'd take it from there. And, but you know, there's a lot of hard work involved in all this. And oh, tell it's, me about uh, it. you got to almost have it in your blood and love to farm and do that type of work. I've done it all of my life, and I loved every day of it. Well, I, mean, I, I, I know. I appreciate people <laughs> like you, and thank you so much for having us today. Well, come back and see me when I have some crawfish stew cooked. Yes, sir. We'll take you up on that. Thank you, Sonny. Next, I visited the Cora, Texas Sugarcane Mill in White Castle, Louisiana, for a tour with Mr. John Angolio, who was the plant manager here for many years. Cora, Texas is a factory that's been in this community for over 75 years, grinding the local cane, and now we go a great distance to get sugar cane. We are now processing over a million tons of cane a year here at Cora, Texas, and also producing up to three million pounds of raw sugar that you see in this location every day. What a mountain of sugar you have at the end of the harvest season. This brown sugar will be refined further into white sugar. I wanted to find out the milling and cooking methods that got the sugar cane to this point. Well, Tracy, it's a pleasure being with you two wonderful gentlemen today. This is Tracy, and this is Adrian. And Tracy, what's your working capacity here? I'm the plant manager. The here. plant manager. And you, Adrian? Fabrication superintendent. Wow, that's a long title. Yeah. Whoa, and here we are. What is this wheel now, uh, Tracy? I'm scared to death of it. It looks like... That you know, large gear is actually the, one of the transmissions for the mill uh -huh. that drives the mill, one of the so tandems. What does it do? It drives the... It drives the mill that actually squeezes, extracts the juice out of the cane. It crushes that's the cane. Exactly right. And the juice run out of it. That's one out of six. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so then after that, the juice goes... After that, the juice goes to the fabrication department. It goes to Mr. Oh, Adrian Monte. So Monge. then that's when you handle it over to Adrian. And right, he, that's correct. He's the guy that takes care of it he from there. He takes care of the okay. cooking. So, right. Well, tell us about that, Adrian. This uh, process is really complicated and not simple to, uh, to explain it in a short time. But the main part of this is to have the, uh, the juice from the cane that is really uh -huh. dirty. Uh -huh. especially with the new combine system they have. And uh, we are in charge of clarifying this juice, eliminate all the impurities. Okay. Uh, how how do you do that? You add something to it? or We, or add, we add uh, milk of lime okay. to neutralize the acids uh -huh. that comes with the cane. Right. And then we settle the coagulation of that. We call it mud. It settles in big clarifiers. Yes. And then from the clarifiers, after it's clean, mm -hmm. we send it to the evaporators. We have 11 evaporators. Okay. And uh, in those evaporators, we get the sugar cane syrup. Okay. Uh, the syrup. Like that, okay. That sugar cane that's syrup. That's what I put on my pancakes. That's right. <laughs> correct. And uh, in this uh, this cane sugar syrup, we bring it to the pan for another step where you have to cook it longer okay. under vacuum. Uh -huh. So when we get to the saturation point of this solution, the, the crystal becomes in the solution. Okay. It's a crystallization process. And after it's crystallized, we send it to the centrifugals. We have 11 centrifugals to dry this, the sugar out. Uh -huh. And then we wash it, not much, just enough to get part of the molasses out, to leave a, a heavy film of molasses around the crystals. And then we send it to the warehouse where we ship it to the refinery. All right. 
One of the amazing things I've learned about sugarcane milling is that the bagasse, or leftover solids from the cane stalk, are used to fuel the mill. So there's no waste. Every part of the sugarcane plant is used. Raising cane in Louisiana isn't easy. It's a complicated process to turn it into sugar, too. It's only through the hard work and expertise of these folks that we can put a sweet touch to our cooking. And I definitely have a sweet touch in my cooking because I have a sweet tooth. So now that our Cornish hens are done, I'm gonna get them out of the oven and show you what they look like. Yes, good. Oh, aren't they beautiful? Mmm, smells good too. I can't wait to eat them with my rice dressing, okay? Now, so to accommodate all this meal, or accompany all this meal, I should say. You know, Cajuns don't know what, how to talk. I'm gonna fix some sweet potatoes, because I love baked sweet potatoes. And this is really how Mama used to cook them, and taught me how to cook them. And she fixed them like this, and I dearly love them. Of course, you've got white sugar in here, and you've got light brown sugar in here. Now this actually is some of the sugar that I got from the meal I visited. You know that sugar mountain we were looking at? Well, that's part of it. I brought it home with me. <laughs> I wanted to bring a truckload, but they wouldn't let me. They said I'd just have to grow my own cane. So you mix this sugar all together, and to this you add cinnamon. Mmm, smells so good. This is some fresh cinnamon that a friend of mine who is a pie baker, he's a pie man actually, let me borrow, out of, he gave it to me. And uh, I use that because it smells so good. It really gave, gave this a good flavor. Of course, sweet potatoes are sweet anyway. All right, mix this all together. Okay, and this is vanilla flavor. So all those wonderful flavorings together really helps this out. Okay, now, good. Okay. Now what I'm gonna add to this, this is really a sweet dish, because you know, I have a sweet tooth. I'm gonna add some of that wonderful syrup from the meal I visited. And this is that, look at this, how beautiful it is. Gorgeous. By the way, this is a wonderful remembrance of my mom too, because this was her, one of her, one of hers, one of the little syrup holders that I had at home. And then I'm gonna put some nutmeg to this. So fresh nutmeg, you know, I love my fresh nutmeg. And this is my little space gadget that I like to use. So just measure by hand. Okay, mix this all up together. Mm -hmm. Very good. Then I'm gonna use some of this juice. Now you see how I use my hands? You gotta really have that. This is, there you go. Mix it all together. This kind of blends it in and it makes it to where you can stir it real easy. Make it just enough to where you can pour it over here. Man, can you imagine this? This is gonna be wonderful. Oof, I can't wait to eat it. Now, put it over here. There you go. Man, on top of this, now mama didn't like pineapple on hers, but I just, I like to kind of add a little flavor to mine, so I'm gonna fix it the way I, I like it today. I like to add a little pineapple on top of here. A little pineapple, did I say? <laughs> well, you know, I, I just exaggerate on everything anyway. So then I'm gonna top this with a little butter, dabs of butter. Whoops, whoa, flying butter. Okay, maybe I ought to do it the right way. This is the way I usually do it, so. Of course, there you go, you dot that with butter. Now, I'm gonna bake this in the oven, I guess for about 20 minutes at 350, and let it really, oh, that wonderful syrup and sugar will just bake those sweet potatoes so nice, and oh, it'll be smelling so good, you'll know when to pull it out. Then what I'm gonna do after it's all baked, I'm gonna put some miniature marshmallows. So since we had the baby chickens, I thought I'd use the baby marshmallows today. And I'm gonna top that and really brown the marshmallows on top of this. But let's put our sweet potatoes baking first, okay? Mm -hmm. And this is what it looks like when it comes out of the oven. Of course, you can't have a meal like this without a wonderful pecan pie. And this recipe is from 
It was from a seminary, and my uh, brother-in-law, Raymond, had brought this recipe home with him, and I said, oh, gosh, this is great. So actually, he is the one responsible for this. So what I have is sugar in here, just plain white sugar, and these are egg whites. So then I put all this together. Oops. Beat it up real good. Now, this is something you don't need to put in a mixer or, or blender. You just go ahead and beat it up by hand because it's really not that hard to do. You just whip it up like this, and you add your vanilla flavor in it. Real easy. Now, to this, I'm going to add the light syrup. And I don't use the dark syrup in my pecan pies. I use the light syrup. So this is what I like. Some people say syrup. Well, Cajuns say syrup. So this is a Cajun pie today. Very good. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to see if get this here. Might need it. Then to this, I'm going to add my pecans, of course. Again, some people say pecans, but we Cajuns say pecans. So, okay. Now, mix it up real good. And honey, you bake this in the oven, and you add... Well, you can add ice cream on top of it, but I kind of like it just like this. This is my daughter Melissa's favorite pie, I think. Of course, it's all of my pies are her favorite pies, so. All right, then you pour it in your pie shell. By the way, this is one of my cheating pie shells that I got, and uh, I just love those refrigerated pie shells because <laughs> they're so easy. You just take them out and you just put them in a package. Yeah, okay. Now I'm going to add this on top because actually we need to do that before we bake it. Then I'm going to stick this in the oven for about 45 minutes. And this is what the finished pecan pie looks like when it's done. But I want to share with you a very special salad because this is from my dad. This was sweet lettuce salad. What you do, you sprinkle vinegar on top here and you sprinkle sugar right on top of it. And you refrigerate this. Of course, this is that Freely lettuce that's wonderful. It's real good. And you just refrigerate this for a couple of hours, and honey, you just don't know what you miss. So anyway, cooking a meal like this always makes me feel so good. And the best part about it, of course, is enjoying it with my family and friends. And I hope that you can do the same. Today I'm at the LSU Rural Life Museum on Burden Plantation in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I'm learning a lot about making sugar and syrup. Of course, we come out of the field and we've got this raw material here. This is a piece of sugar cane. This piece of sugar cane is ground. Then the juices are extracted and poured into this big kettle. And then they're putting some lime in here. All the impurities will float up to the top. This skimmer will be used in order to skim all the impurities out of here. The juices that's left from there will be poured into the next kettle and cooked until it forms a syrupy consistency. If they want the syrup, they will take that out with this large dipper here, pour it into the big drums or vats, whatever. And if not, they're going to put it into the last kettle, which will cook until that syrup crystallizes and forms beautiful sugar. I have a wonderful letter from a friend of mine, Miss Gwen Brooks from Napa, California. Gwen writes, Dear Miss Lucy, I loved your TV cooking show. I'm 70 years old and had forgotten my mother made leaf lettuce salad with sugar and vinegar when I was a child until I saw you make it on TV. I had everything on hand and made it twice that day. What lovely memories and delicious eating. Encloses my check. Please send me a copy of your cookbook. Thank you, Gwen. Thank you, Miss Gwen, for sending this lovely letter. It sure has been a pleasure hearing from you, and it's always a pleasure hearing from all of y'all. So please continue to write to me. And, of course, continue watching because we'll have some more exciting features for you. Thank you. Look us 
up on the World Wide Web at lpb.org. The Louisiana Seafood Marketing Board is a proud sponsor of Lucy's Classic Cajun Culture and Cooking Show. The Bayou State enjoys an outstanding culinary tradition. At the center of that tradition is seafood. And no wonder, Louisiana is one of the nation's leading seafood suppliers. And the Louisiana Department of Economic Development. Whether it's crawfish processing or meat packing, Louisiana is the business location for food processing with infrastructure, site selection assistance, and workforce training. Louisiana, the shape of food technology. <laughs> 